In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the inverse Fourier transform. I will explain the mechanics of how it works, and I'll show you a few examples in MATLAB. The forward Fourier transform, which is what you've learned so far, gets you from the time domain to the frequency domain using complex sine waves. The result of the Fourier transform is the series of Fourier coefficients, which tell you how much amplitude and with which phase the signal matches the complex sine wave at each frequency. So the inverse Fourier transform is simply the opposite of this. We already have the Fourier coefficients and we know the frequencies of the sine waves. So you just multiply each Fourier coefficient by its associated complex sine wave, sum all of the modulated sine waves together, and the result is the original signal. Here you can see some pseudocode for the inverse Fourier transform loop over frequencies, create a complex sine wave, same as with the forward Fourier transform, and then the extra step is multiply the sine wave by the corresponding complex Fourier coefficient, corresponding in terms of the frequency, and then you sum all of these modulated complex sine waves together. In the end, we'll have to divide the result by n, the number of frequencies, because this loop involves just adding more and more sine waves together, and so we need to normalize by dividing by the number of summations. Let's have a look in MATLAB. Here is the simulated signal. It contains two spectral components at 4 hertz and at 6.5 hertz. This is the forward Fourier transform. This is nothing new. This is what you learned in previous videos. And now here is the inverse Fourier transform. So here I'm looping over points. Here I construct the complex sine wave at each frequency. And now I multiply the complex sine wave by the corresponding Fourier coefficient that I derived from the forward Fourier transform. And then I sum that modulated complex sine wave onto the reconstructed signal. And then finally, as I mentioned, we need to divide by the number of frequencies because here we are just summing over and over again. Here you can see the results. This is the original signal in the blue line and the red circles indicate the reconstructed signal. And you can see that they're a good match. There is one key difference between the complex sine waves here in the inverse Fourier transform and the complex sine waves here in the forward Fourier transform. And that is the negative sign here inside the exponential. Notice in the forward Fourier transform there is a negative sign, and in the inverse Fourier transform there is no negative sign. You need the negative sign in one of them so that the imaginary coefficients cancel during the inverse. This is because of what I mentioned a few videos ago about the cosine identity and how you need a positive complex exponential and a negative complex exponential to create a real valued sine wave. Another thing I would like to point out in the code is that I extract the real part of the signal when I am plotting. In fact, there is no imaginary component to the signal. It's all real valued, which it should be because the original signal was all real valued. However, there are some tiny computer rounding errors and discretization errors that cause very, very small, near zero imaginary components for a few of the modulated sine waves, typically at or close to the Nyquist frequency. So you can see that in fact this reconstructed signal contains imaginary components, and if we type whose, then we see that this reconstructed signal is a complex number. However, so here's the real part that reconstructed the original signal. Now if I plot the imaginary part on top of that, you can see that the imaginary part is uh, zero all the way through. If you would zoom in, you would probably see at 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 12, there are some non-zero values in there, but we can treat it as zero. Next, I would like to show you the inverse Fourier transform reconstructing the original signal one frequency component at a time. 
Here I'm creating the signal. It's a different signal this time. It's slightly more complicated because there's a sine embedded in a cosine. That's just to give the signal more interesting features. Here I construct the forward Fourier transform. Here's some plotting. And here, this is the loop that contains the inverse Fourier transform. So these two lines contain the inverse Fourier transform. And what I do inside this statement here is update the plot so you can see the reconstruction of the original time series going frequency by frequency. So it's going to produce an animation. So it'll show up once and I'll walk you through what's going on during the animation and then I'll show it again. Here you see in blue these the original signal. In black is the reconstructed signal that's being reconstructed frequency by frequency. Here you see the power spectrum, and you can see that it's drawing the power spectrum out one frequency at a time until it gets here, then it skips to the end. These are all the positive frequencies, these are the negative frequencies. Notice that the signal is not perfectly reconstructed only from the positive frequencies. It's only at the negative frequencies where the signal eventually becomes a perfect reconstruction of the original signal. So it's a pretty neat video to watch and I encourage you to uh, watch it several times until you start getting an intuition about what's happening. You can see that the lower frequencies get reconstructed first and then it's only later do the higher frequency characteristics start appearing in the reconstructed signal. Here when it's halfway through you see that the signal looks like the original signal but it's not the full amplitude. In fact it's only half of the amplitude because we need all of the negative frequencies. There you go. Uh, the last thing I'll point out is it looks like the reconstructed signal is changing in sudden jumps or sudden leaps but actually it's changing continuously. It looks like it's moving in jumps because there are these small discrete uh, bursts of high power at specific frequencies. That's just a result of the way that I simulated this signal. So in this video I showed you how to compute the inverse Fourier transform once you have the Fourier coefficients. The inverse Fourier transform provides a perfect reconstruction of the original signal provided that you didn't change or alter any of the Fourier coefficients. You might wonder what the purpose of the inverse Fourier transform is. If going from the time domain to the frequency domain provides unique insights into rhythmicity of behavior and signals, then what is the point of applying the inverse Fourier transform to get back to the time domain, particularly considering that the inverse Fourier transform is a perfect reconstruction of the original time domain signal? The importance of the inverse Fourier transform comes from its use as a tool in signal processing. The idea is that many signal processing algorithms, such as convolution, filtering, and cross-correlation, can be done faster and more efficiently in the frequency domain compared to the time domain. Therefore, many signal processing techniques involve applying the forward Fourier transform, applying some signal processing algorithms on the Fourier coefficients, and then applying the inverse Fourier transform to get back to the time domain. I will talk more about this, including specific examples, in a section called Applications of the Fourier Transform.